We've begun talking about zymogens. Let's talk about it in a little bit more detail. We know now that zymogens are always proteases and that proteases are the most dangerous of the digestive enzymes because so much of the important stuff that a cell does is done by proteins. Um, and also because the outer surface of cell membranes are covered essentially with proteins. Um, zymogens are enzymes and scientists have named them so that most of them end with the letters O-G-E-N. As a matter of fact, if you ever see the name of a molecule that ends in O-G-E-N, it's probably a zymogen. The, the exception is estrogen. <laughs> okay, at least one exception I know. Now, these are called proenzymes. Why are they proenzymes? Because they will become enzymes, but they're not active yet. These are molecules, since they're enzymes, they're proteins, that are larger, but they're not active. So that's why they're proenzymes. They will become enzymes when cleavage happens. And what is cleavage? Cleavage is cutting off a piece of the molecule. So let's look here at pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is the zymogen, the proenzyme. And when the ogen gets cut off of it, let me just cleave it for you. When the ogen gets cut off of it, you will be left with the mature enzyme that does its job called pepsin. And we've already learned that pepsin gets activated by hydrochloric acid. It gets cleaved by hydrochloric acid to become pepsin. Now, if in one of my exams, I tell you that pepsinogen gets activated or pepsin gets activated, yeah, I'm not trying to be tricky. I, I know when it comes to the syntax, should we say pepsinogen gets activated or should we say that pepsin gets activated? Yeah, I'm not gonna be tricky like that, okay? So don't think I'm being tricky. Let's talk about how some other enzymes get activated. There are three zymogens, these three, that are made by your pancreas. And the pancreas is going to make them and release them and throw them, I cannot write with this thing, made by the pancreas. Um, is going to throw them into the duodenum. We had just gotten our food down to the duodenum a second ago. Um, and when uh, the pancreas puts trypsinogen into the duodenum, it will get activated by an enzyme called enterokinase. Enterokinase is an enzyme that is made by cells of the duodenum. And that enzyme, instead of getting thrown into the solution out there, that enzyme is attached to the villi, actually to the microvilli of the villi, um, that line, that part of the intestinal tract. And because this enzyme, enterokinase, is actually attached to those little microvilli, it gets put into a category known as brush border enzymes. Brush border enzymes are different from the ones we've talked about so far. The ones we've enzymes we've talked about so far, they get made in a gland, they get thrown out where the food is. Brush border enzymes are different because they're attached to the microvilli uh, of the villi and um, to some people that look like a hairbrush, so they call it the brush border. So trypsinogen leaves the pancreas, uh, bumps into enterokinase, enterokinase will, will activate trypsinogen and turn it into trypsin. And then trypsin will do the favor to his friends, chymotrypsinogen and procarboxypeptidase. So trypsin is going to activate these other two zymogens. Okay, so now you know a lot about zymogens. Before we leave the stomach entirely, let's talk a little bit about vomiting. Vomiting is known as emesis. Emesis means vomiting. And the first thing you should know is that it is very common for a patient or a patient's family member to interpret any time that food comes back up out of the mouth, they will consider that vomiting. There's no need to correct them. However, you should know that sometimes when food is coming back out, it's vomiting. Sometimes when food is coming back out, it is actually something called regurgitation. Ooh. Let me see if I can write that for you. 
regurgitation. Regurgitation, okay? Regurgitation doesn't look like vomiting, kind of, except for vomiting is a total body experience. When people are going to vomit, they generally feel nauseated. They know they're going to throw up. They might sweat a little bit, get a little bit shaky. They drool a little bit. They know they're going to throw up, right? And then when they do throw up, it's like the whole body is cooperating with it. That's vomiting. Uh, when you're vomiting, whatever you're throwing up is generally coming from the stomach and it could be coming from the first part of the small intestine as well. So all that stuff's coming up backwards. What is the difference with regurgitation? We generally call something regurgitation if it's just coming up out of the esophagus. I told you that when someone's got chronic um, a heartburn, it can cause that lower end of the esophagus to get narrow. And if the lower end of the esophagus gets narrow and someone swallows a big bite of yummy bread that just kind of lands right there on top of the small hole, then the rest of the meal will just pile up right on top of it. It'll just pile up, pile up, pile up, pile up. And when the esophagus gets full to a certain extent, boom, all that stuff comes back out. So, um, so first of all, you should know that not all vomiting is vomiting. Some of it is regurgitation. Um, so most of you are interested in some kind of a clinical uh, career in health, and it is not a surprise to you that vomiting and diarrhea cases generally are gonna fall to the low man on the totem pole. And I'm gonna tell you some stuff about vomiting that you should know because by knowing it, you could take this uh, lowest of the jobs and turn it into an opportunity to save a life, which yay, um, or make yourself look good to your bosses, all right? First of all, you should be paying attention when, when the patient or the patient's family is talking. If the patient ever says, I was enjoying my meal, and then all of a sudden out it came, you that is something that the doctor who's in charge of this case will want to know right? Because that would be a sign that it could be regurgitation. Vomiting in an older patient, oh, that can be very difficult to work up, could be caused by so many things. But regurgitation, it would make them think, maybe I should scope this patient, look down there, and if I see a narrowing, bang, I can fix that right there. The doctor loves looking like a hero and spending the min minimal amount of time and money getting there. And the doctor will love you or the head nurse or whoever will love you, right? So knowing the difference between regurgitation and vomiting. By the way, children do swallow stuff that doesn't wanna go all the way down into the stomach. So when children are enjoying their meal and playing and happy and all of a sudden, bleh, um, again, that's something the doctor will want to know. It's worth writing down. Now let's talk about this thing, hematemesis. Hematemesis literally means uh, vomiting blood. And you probably think you know what vomiting blood would look like. I bet you don't, okay? First of all, it doesn't look like blood. It actually looks quite a bit like coffee grounds. Why? Because hemoglobin is a protein. And when hemoglobin meets the hydrochloric acid in the stomach, the protein denatures, and it doesn't look bright red and it doesn't look liquid anymore. It turns into this kind of, it kind of looks like a reddish brown dirt or maybe like coffee grounds. So if a mom or dad ever brings in their little one and says, my son or daughter is vomiting dirt, I don't know why, I don't let him eat dirt, I'm pretty sure he didn't eat dirt, or your, uh, a mom brings in a kid and says, my little one is vomiting coffee grounds. I told my husband to be careful where he threw him away. He says he was, but I bet he wasn't, okay? The, you should not be thinking about dirt or coffee grounds. You should be thinking maybe that child has actually got vomiting of blood. Now, vomiting of blood is a medical emergency. Most of the time when babies come into an ER or an urgent care center and they're vomiting, uh, particularly if the doctor is busy, they're going to pat the mom on the head and they're there, there's something going around and, you know, send the baby home. 
right? With give it some Pedialyte. But if that baby actually has hematemesis, sending the baby home could mean that when the baby comes back, they've got a perforated ulcer. The doctor who sent the baby home looks really bad and feels really bad, right? So if you think there could be hematemesis or you're cleaning something up and it looks like coffee grounds or like dirt, then that's something the doctor needs to know because they will work that child up and take care of that child in a very different way. That could change, save the baby's life and save the doctor from feeling really bad about sending a very sick child home. Why would a child have a bleeding ulcer in their stomach? Well, it's not because they're worried about potty training. Uh, the most common reason children will have a bleeding ulcer in their stomach would be two things. One is swallowing a penny. Pennies are beautiful and bright and lots of kids want to swallow uh, pennies, especially when they're shiny. But modern pennies are made mostly with zinc and zinc that sits in the stomach um, can cause a bleeding ulcer in a child. Um, children also will sometimes swallow batteries, particularly watch batteries, and those can cause a bleeding ulcer in a child. So uh, if particularly um, you see coffee grounds or hear about coffee grounds or eating dirt or anything like that, make sure you're thinking about hematemesis. Let's talk about very foul smelling vomit, okay? Vomit never smells good. I don't mean to imply that it ever does. But vomit doesn't smell like diarrhea, right? If there's ever a mom or a dad or a caregiver of an elderly person and they're saying, you know what? I saw the kid throw up, it looks like vomit, but it smells like diarrhea. Or you walk into a, uh, an exam room and the child just threw up and it smells like diarrhea, but the mom's saying it was vomiting, whew, that is something that the doctor needs to know. I mean, yeah, you've got to clean it up. The doctor doesn't. But you, the doctor needs to know that because particularly, well, for anyone, when the vomit that's coming out smells like diarrhea, it has come from very low inside the intestinal tract, and that's not normal. And it can be a sign of an obstruction. Obstructions in children can have, happen for a couple reasons, but uh, swallowing something they shouldn't have is certainly one of them. Uh, uh, an obstruction in an older person is generally going to be caused by some kind of a cancer that is uh, wrapping around the intestinal tract. So these are some things that you should make sure you know. These are all things that will allow you, as the poor low man on the totem pole that has to clean up the vomit, it'll allow you to maybe save a life and uh, even if that's not enough, and probably it is, but if that's not enough, it also makes the doctor that you're working with look good. And when they look good, they're happy with you, right? We are going to pick up from here on the next video.